on behalf of festival co-directors Namita Gokhale and William Dalrymple and all my colleagues at Teamwork Arts, welcome back to JLF's Brave New World. Those of you who missed our earlier sessions featuring brilliant list of speakers, including His Holiness the Dalai Lama, uh, Neil Gaiman, Margaret Atwood, Shashi Tharoor, and Papan Barma, Shubha Day, and Anubhav Sinha, and all of the others, you can catch these on our Facebook page, GLF Lit Fest, or on our YouTube channel, Jaipur Lit Fest GLF. Our official radio partner is Red FM, Bajate Raho. Our next session today is A Burning, Writing and Resistance. Megha Majumdar in conversation with Mansi Subramanian. Megha Majumdar's dazzling debut novel, A Burning, examines the aspirations, heartbreaks, and tragedies of three tangled lives in present-day Kolkata. She speaks with editor Manasi Subramaniam about her new book, Literary Fiction and the Craft of Writing. Megha Majumdar was born and raised in Kolkata, India. She moved to the United States to attend college at Harvard University, followed by graduate school in social anthropology at John Hopkins University. She works as an editor at Catapult. A Burning is her new first book, and it's been absolutely incredible. It's climbed the charts, and as many of you know, has got rave reviews from across the world. Manasi Subramaniam is a senior commissioning editor and head of literary rights at Penguin Random House India. Please do remember to comment and ask questions by typing it in the comment section below. Do also follow our handles, JLF, Fest, uh, JLF Lit Fest on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get notified on the upcoming sessions. And of course, in case you uh, drop off due to bandwidth issues, you can find us on our YouTube channel, Jaipur Lit Fest JLF. And of course, if we drop off, which we inevitably do, just hang in there and we'll be right back on Facebook. Ladies and gentlemen, a burning writing and resistance, Megha Majumdar in conversation with Mansi Subramani. Thank you so much, Sanjay. Thank you, Sanjay, and hello, everyone. Welcome to the session, Writing and Resistance, with Megha Majumdar, whose debut novel, A Burning, has just been published this month to a wonderful reception all over the world. I've had the great privilege of working with Megha on A Burning, so this conversation is a real treat for me. So first of, first of all, Megha, congratulations. It must be so exciting. It's no mean feat to have a debut novel out in the middle of a global pandemic. So it must be very, very exciting to see the kind of wonderful reception it's received all over the world. Thank you so much, Manasi. Um, I just want to say that this conversation is so special to me for everybody watching. Manasi is being very modest when she says she worked on the book. She's the editor of the book. So she has led the book through all of its processes, through publication. Um, and it is really her work and her team's work um, which, you know, has opened so many doors for the book and allowed it to find its readers so far. So I'm very grateful. Um, it's been, you know, I mean, you know this very well, but it's been such a surreal time, you know, on the one hand, this is, of course, a book that I've worked on for years. And I did not anticipate that this would be the moment that it launches into. So I'm trying to remember that, um, I'm so proud of the book. I worked hard on it. I hope it finds its readers. And at the same time, I recognize that, you know, people are dealing with um, so much during this pandemic, taking care of family, dealing with lost wages and lost jobs. And so there are huge questions and huge things at stake right now. So I see behind you a copy of the US edition <laughs> of A Burning. And this is a bit bittersweet because I know you haven't seen the Indian edition yet. So I want to yeah. show it to you. This is what it looks like. Oh, oh it looks amazing. I can't wait for wait to hold a copy of that and for you to hold a copy of this because yes, it feels same. so good. Yeah, it looks beautiful. I'm so happy to see its different different faces. Two very different but very evocative co covers which play with color so brilliantly. I'm so happy to see this. Yeah. Uh, I'd like us to begin by talking about the book itself. Uh, for those of you who haven't read A Burning, which you should, you absolutely should, it's a remarkable novel. Uh, a Burning begins with a tragedy. There is a terrorist attack 
on uh, on a train and a young woman becomes the prime suspect in the terror attack and the entire novel is told from the perspective of three main characters one character from her past who is her old teacher from her school a physical education teacher who is referred to in the novel as pt sir and a young woman called lovely an aspiring actress whom uh, jeevan the protagonist helps by teaching her english these two characters are called in as witnesses uh, in jeevan's court trial and they begin to find that their own aspirations and their rise in the world is inextricably linked to the fall of jeevan so this is a book about the choices that these three characters make uh megha i'd like to begin by asking you each of your characters finds a way to tell their story to the world in very very different ways and using very different vehicles the book begins with a social media post that jeevan posts and goes on goes on to tell have jeevan tell her entire personal story to a journalist on the other hand you have pt sir who finds voice in his political rallies when he begins to speak up and we have lovely whose uh, fame is released when she puts out whatsapp videos of herself performing various roles and these are all characters who use different vehicles of self expression but these modes of self expression whether it's social media or journalism they all find ways to both support and fail these characters and i wanted to ask you how it is that you had these these vehicles play out in the way these characters express themselves and why it is that different modes of expression work differently for different characters hmm that's a great question um i think so you know one thing that i was very attentive to is how social media might sometimes be thought of as this um free terrain you know this terrain where you can say anything but i wanted to look at how somebody who has certain vulnerabilities in their real life those vulnerabilities carry over into the space of social media you know so much of this book is about who is believed who gets the chance to tell their own story and star in their own narrative and who has a narrative imposed on them so looking at all of these different ways of expression like you said you know political rallies um social media turning to traditional news media when you feel like the courts and the police system have let you down um all of those are just ways that these characters are trying to to make their ways forward that word that you just used uh, megha vulnerability i think it's so important in this particular book i we often see that india is described as uh, a country of aspiration especially when we're talking about the youth of india and it's interesting for me that these three characters have three very different aspirations jeevan tells us that what she wants is to be part of india's new middle class we have a uh, uh, lovely whose aspiration is to light up the screen and we have pt sir who i don't think he quite knows it yet but then comes to realize that what he wants is a certain kind of power and the their aspirations are very interesting to me because you have all three of them get to a breaking point where the aspiration turns into a kind of desperation and i'm interested in the choices that they make when they meet that that breaking point when hope turns to despair can you tell us a little bit about how you set what you set out to do with these three characters and how it is that you had them make these choices you know i wanted to i started with kind of three original questions which led to these three characters um the big question for the book of course that i had was how do people chase big dreams and hold on to their ambitions when they are living under oppressive and discriminatory systems um and so i ask how somebody who um you know how this woman who like you said all she wants is to keep her job at the mall she wants to be middle class she wants to enjoy her new phone um but she makes this politically risky comment on facebook and then she she gets into big trouble for it so you know how can this person find or find a way to get her own narrative out into the world and resist 
the narrative which is being pushed on her by the state. Um, the second character, Lovely, I wanted to write this kind of joyous, defiant arc for this person who from the very margins of society wants to move to its very center. She holds, you know, what I think is a wild dream of becoming a movie star. And then for PT Sir, it was very interesting to look at this character who, um, you know, he's a school teacher. He feels that he's not really having the kind of vigorous impact on the name that he might like. And he gets a little bit of political power. He becomes close to this right-wing political party. So what moral choices will he make? And part of what is interesting to me is also looking at how living in these oppressive systems forces us to make certain choices, right? Even the ways in which um, we can decide whether to serve ourselves and our families or whether to do something for the greater good, to be generous to somebody else. Those aren't completely free choices. Those are very limited choices. We've talked about the oppressions of a system of, of structural inequality, if you will. Did you set out to write a political novel? I think so many books are political. I don't know if it is possible to write a novel which doesn't grapple with power and freedom in some way. Um, you know, I was very aware that I wanted to say something, I wanted to ask something about what was happening, certainly in India, but of course also around the world and here in the US as well. Um, but I also knew that I wanted to do it in the space of fiction where I would have the chance to be close to these characters and build these characters who I hope I tried um, are full, full people, robust people who hold contradictions, who sometimes act morally and sometimes immorally, sometimes selfishly and sometimes generously. So I felt that having these complex uh, I think you've dropped off. I think Megha is frozen, Mansi, and she yeah, should be I, back I, any I second. So I, maybe while she is off, why don't you tell us a little bit more about why you picked the book? Oh, uh, a lot of people forget that as they send manuscript after manuscript, and this is a question we get kept get, getting asked, why did you pick the book? Sanjay, I stayed up all night reading it. I mean, I, the thing that happened to me when I got the book in my hands is that I couldn't put it down. I read it overnight. Oh, oh Megha, you're back. Uh, I think I froze for a second. Yeah, Sorry, Megha, just told Mansi, finish, the, finish that answer. No, I know. What, what, Sanjay asked me why it is that I, that I wanted to publish your book. And I was saying to him that I couldn't put it down. I stayed up all night reading it. Uh, and I read for a living, I read for pleasure. Reading is my entire life in so many ways. But I always know what it means to stay up all night and read a book and not want to put it down before you go to bed. And I always know what a special thing that is. So to answer Sandra's question, that's why I knew I wanted to publish this book. But back to what you were saying. Um, I think my, my answer got cut off at some point, but um, I was just talking about how it was important to me to build full characters who could hold contradictions and who could be as close to human as I could make them. And that felt like my strongest vehicle um, for asking these bigger questions. Do you, think, uh, do you think that there is an obligation, if there is at all, uh, of writers, particularly fiction writers, to engage with a politically fraught world? Is there a duty of some kind for fiction writers? You know, this is something I've been thinking about. I think, um, I think I do think that fiction has a responsibility to engage the world. For me, the most powerful fiction. I think Megha's frozen again. Uh, I keep saying the world today is broken up into two parts, those who have bandwidth and those who haven't. <laughs> That's our new reality, yeah. Mansi. So, so you read you read the book through the night, and then what happened? 
Well, no, I, so I read the book through the night. I knew, I knew immediately that in that sort of visceral way in which you know that something, something special is happening. Uh, I, we, we jointly bought the book along with our colleagues in the US at Knopf. So I rang up my colleagues there and overnight I said, look, I have to have it. Let's do whatever it takes. Wow. Mansi is back. Megha's back, Mansi. Ah, Megha's back. <laughs> okay. I'm, uh, just to move on from what we were discussing just now, um, it is, it, you, you said that it, it is the role of fiction writers to also engage with the world. But fiction as a vehicle is very different from nonfiction. Uh, you have a journalist in your novel, for example, who almost almost picks uh, a fictitious way of handling a story that he has told. So tell me what it is that changes when, when we're surrounded by fake news and propaganda in so many ways. What is the relationship between fiction and truth then? I mean, I hope, I think that every fiction writer, certainly I feel this way. What you want is for your book through these made up worlds and made up characters to hold some truth, right? You want to open certain doors so that a reader can bring their own experiences and own opinions to the book and find something truthful there. The capturing of that truth is, you know, of course, where all of that work comes in. Um, but I think so much of fiction is also, um, it begins in a place of paying attention to the world. So it begins mm. in a place which is quite far removed from the act of, you know, sitting down before a page and writing in solitude. It begins from this place of close observation. It begins from paying attention to what is happening around you. Um, I think if you're not paying attention, it's very hard to write truthful fiction. That's how I feel about myself anyway. But what you've also done, which uh, I touched upon when I was chatting to Sonjoy about the book just now, is this is one of those rare literary beasts that is a slow burner and a page turner. Tell me about your process. How does that happen? How does a writer <laughs> write something that is this thrilling, but at the same time gives you so much to think about and is also slow somehow? Uh, well, thank you, Manasi. I think... Something that I worked on was I wanted to write a book that would feel um, swift and immersive. I knew that in order for the kind of force that I wanted it to have, it also needed to be entertaining. I think that was kind of the challenge that I set myself is can I write a book that feels intellectually serious but is also entertaining? Um, and, you know, I, I answered that question through all of these craft techniques. Like you're saying, I was very attentive to pacing. Um, I was very attentive to how TV shows accomplish this, actually. And, you know, just this idea of how people binge watch shows and you kind of find yourself drawn into the story where you want to go from episode to episode. You have to know what happens to this character. So I was attentive to openings and closings and how scenes progress um, and that kind of movement just to see how I could bring that same element of fun and entertainment into the book. Um, and of course, it's, it's up to each reader to decide if if that is true for them or not, but that's kind of what I tried to do. So for someone like me who read the book in a single sitting, I have to ask, how long did it take you to actually write a book that I read in a few hours? <laughs> There's... Sorry, I think you broke up just for a second there. Oh, four years. Four years? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I can, it, it's clear to me that it does take that much time and effort to create something that's that, that's that tight and that's tightly knit. It's, that's extraordinary. Uh, I, know, I, I think, wanted, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that I think you know this very well from your work um, as an editor that, you know, so much of shaping a book is in edits and rewriting and structural changes and moving chapters around. And so, so much of that process of getting it to a place where it reads 
swiftly is, you know, the result of really tinkering with it over a long time and asking it these hard questions of, okay, where is this book boring? Where is it confusing? Where does it lose me? <laughs> I, I always think that if you can't see the effort that goes into a book, that's when you know a lot of effort has gone into it because the work needs to be invisible. It needs to look effortless. So, I mean, I can see that you, those were four years truly well spent. <laughs> Thanks, I Mansi. I wanted to talk about um, one of the things that we touched upon was that I don't think any of us know what world a book is going to go out into. No writer knows what the world is going to be when a book comes out. Certainly, I don't think any of us knew that your book was going to come out in the middle of the situation that we're in right now, which is a global pandemic. Uh, and yet... One of the things that I see, especially in the responses from people all over the world, is that the book seems to be speaking to the current moment. And we're talking about, whether we're talking about social media, a kind of mass media hysteria, whether we're talking about fake news, um, the ways in which the justice system has failed the individual, uh, structural inequalities, the book seems to speak to a current moment, despite our rather specific location and uh, despite the specificity with which you've set the atmosphere of the book, why is it that it's speaking so strongly to the moment we're in right now? Um, I wonder if it has something to do with the way in which the pandemic has exposed all of these fault lines. You know, I think the pandemic has compelled people to look once more at these old systemic problems that exist, you know, who is most strongly affected, you know, who is really bearing the brunt of this time, who is looking at, you know, a, a precarious reality because of this situation. And I think those are questions that ask us to look at the society that we live within. You know, those are questions that ask us to look at our systems and our networks and institutions. Um, and I guess the other part of this is that there are some elements in the book which um, I think have, have struck a chord perhaps here in the U.S., given the protests underway in the U.S., um, you know, protests against racism and a history of police brutality. And, you know, there's a character in the book who is injured because of police brutality. Um, until a few days ago, there was a curfew in Brooklyn. Uh, and in the opening pages of the book, there is a curfew. So perhaps it is that those very specific things are sparking um, thought for people who are outside India as well. And how has, how has the response been in the U.S.? Uh, I've been re reading the reviews, of course, but I'm sure you're talking to readers as well. Um, it has been really gratifying. So grateful for, you know, is very often I'll be just scrolling on <laughs> Instagram and uh, my book pops up and I'll see that somebody has read it and written a really thoughtful review. Um, so it's, it's really great not just to see attention, but to see such deep and thoughtful engagement with it. I think that is such an honor as a writer to see someone spending so much time with your book and bringing so much to the pages. And did you need the kind of distance that you've had from India, that is, you've been in the US for a little while now, and you've been writing the book over the last four years, did you need this much distance to be able to observe, as you said you did? I think about that, you know, I wonder what I might be writing had I stayed in India. Um, and I get those like questions you have about a different life path that you'll never truly be able to answer. Um, but I do, I do think that having some distance from India um, helped me bring some things into focus for sure. Uh, and this is a debut novel and you work in publishing as well. So you know how rare it is for a debut novel to get this kind of attention. And I think it's so wonderful. I'm so pleased for you. I am so happy 
about the kind of attention the book has been giving but do you have advice for young writers who are also setting out into the world who are ready to send their own books out into the world that's a great question um you know the way that i did it was um i kept the book very close to my chest for most of the time and i when i felt like i was ready to send it out to agents and start looking for a literary agent which if anybody watching is is unfamiliar um how it works is you as the writer don't directly submit to the publisher or that it's that's at least how it works in the us it might be different in india but you sign with um a person called a literary agent who kind of represents you and they submit on your behalf so the first step for me as a writer was to find a literary agent that i could work with and um before i did that i felt that i would have one shot at this you know one chance to grab someone's interest and move them so i actually found it very helpful to put the book down for long stretches of time i think i put it down for 3 weeks at some point um maybe a month around there long enough so that you can come back to the pages with fresh eyes and pick up on flaws and things that you want to fix you know the things that you feel like you are unable to spot because you've been with the book for so long and tinkered with it so much so putting it away for a bit is very helpful um and then once you come back if you feel like you have brought it to the place where you don't know what else you can do to make it better at that point you really need the attention of an agent and an editor who will then kind of take it to the next level with you so we've talked uh, about the hopes and aspirations of your characters mega so what is your hope for the book as you now send the book out into the world uh what what would you like it to achieve do you think books can accomplish change this session is called writing and resistance and i think it's important we talk about resistance do you think a book like this is a tool of resistance and can it bring about change in the world you know i think the answer to that has to be quite nuanced um a book is of course not the same as activism and you know it is performing in quite a different space but i do hope that a book by showing how people refuse to accept what society tells them they must accept and by you know reaching for a better life these characters i hope that they do show how people push back against oppressive systems you know how people are constantly trying to improve their lives and um i think there is a form of hopeful joyous resistance in that i think that a book can function as a way for a reader to think about injustice and hope and resistance in their own lives i do hope that this book is helpful as an instrument someone picks it up and reads it i hope that it encourages them to think about the forms of injustice which might look like what's in the book and it might look quite different from what's in the book but forms and appearances of injustice in their own community um and then you know i think i have the hope that every writer has for their book which is um i hope it has a life of its own you know i hope it has um a a long life in which it finds its readers and are you hopeful for resistance movements all over the world the world the world we're living right now has been seeing resistance movements i know we certainly have in india i know you have in the us do you have hope for resistance as a movement absolutely i mean i don't know how you can look at protests and you know the uprising underway and not feel hopeful i think there is there is great hope in it um and 
again, bringing it back to books, it's not, you know, the field that you and I work in, which is books. Again, books in themselves are not activism. They are very, very different, of course. But I think that there is a kind of hopeful resistance in the act of working on books and publishing books as well, you know, in the act of championing books, which are doing ambitious new things, which are allowing writers to pursue, you know, their curiosity and their joy. So I think that there is um, great optimism just in working on a book and saying this will be out in a year or two years and it will find its readers and it will perhaps transform somebody's life and you might not even know about it. Well, we have a, only a few minutes to go. So I want to end by asking you, uh, just to continue from what you just said, could you recommend a few books that you've been reading and enjoying that exemplify the act of resistance in the way we just talked about? Um, oh, so many books. Um, I really like this book called, I have it right here. Um, I have, I like this book called We Need New Names by No Violet Bulawayo. Um, it's set in Zimbabwe. It's about a group of kids who are dreaming of a better life. And um, one of them emigrates and moves to the US. But this book has such complex, mischievous, real children and if anybody watching is you know a writer who is writing child characters you know how hard it is so this book I highly recommend another book that i really love is davy lascar's the atlas of reds and blues um it's about it's a novel it's about an indian american woman who is shot in her driveway by a police officer and in that wounded state, she reflects on her whole life and the events that brought her to that moment. So highly recommend these two books. Thank you so much. We've got a couple of questions that have just come in. Um, Madhavi Saraswat asks, amongst the turmoil that's going on in India with respect to politics, religion, and community, you've chosen to go ahead with a theme that focuses on the impact that one has to face owing to one's gender identity or religion. What research did you have to do to be, did you have to be involved in? And were you able to conclude the topic that you had conceptualized? Um, thank you for that question. Um, you know, I have a background in anthropology, so I am always very drawn to reading ethnographies. Um, I love reading ethnographies. So I read ethnographies by um, Gayatri Reddy, um, Web of Saria, to learn more about Hijra communities. Um, I watched a lot of documentary videos by local news channels to gain a sense for places that I didn't have access to, like, you know, the kitchen in a women's prison. Um, but also I do feel that um, the book feels like it comes from a very personal place. For me, um, I was drawing on kind of years of the accumulated experience of reading the news and, and watching the world around me and listening to adults around me. Um, and in terms of, uh, to the question of, you know, did I, did I do it successfully? I think that is definitely something for, for each reader to decide for themselves. I tried to write complex characters. Um, I tried to write characters who have agency and push back in nuanced ways and in the ways that they can. Um, but of course, I think this is true of every book. It's up to each reader to decide if that speaks to them or not. Uh, Sachdev Ramakrishna asks, what is your reaction to people saying that your writing style resembles Jhumpa Lahiri or Yagyasi? Well, it's such an honor. <laughs> I mean, they are icons and I love their work. So, you know, it's quite surreal to be in a place where you work on this private document for years and years in complete solitude. And then all of a sudden, it's not a private document anymore. It's this public object that, you know, other people can pick up and respond to. Um, so I've been very grateful for those comparisons. 
Um, okay, I, I'm going to. Yeah, Devjani Mukherjee asks, how many hours per day did you devote in writing this book, and what were your challenges in the process? What motivated you to become a writer? Thank you, Devjani. Um, I, you know, the whole time that I was working on this book, I had a full time job. I still have a full time job, so. It's not like I was sitting down to write for hours and hours, and that was the only thing I was doing all day. Far from it, I was often putting in a few minutes before going into work. Um, so that could be anywhere from you know fifteen or twenty minutes on some days when I had very busy work days, um, or forty-five minutes or an hour on other days, just to carve out that bit of time before. Um, you know, my mind became occupied by the concerns of the day. I found that so valuable. And what kept me going was, you know, there is great freedom in feeling like nobody cares if you write your book or not. You know, the world isn't waiting for my book. So it was up to me. I felt that I wanted to write it and I put in the time. Otherwise, I would have to live with the regret of knowing that I didn't do the work. I didn't try to do the work that I could have done. Um, and on hard days, I think a very harsh but helpful thing that I reminded myself of was that an unfinished novel is not a novel. So I have to finish my novel. <laughs> That's that's a great line. Um, Sanya asks, how have you worked through the lockdown in NYC and have you begun writing your next book? Um, I am working very slowly on my second novel. And um, how have I been working through this pandemic? I mean, you know, I think it's, it's a little strange because in some ways, of course, it feels like... Um, a work from home situation, but you have this psychic toll of the pandemic, mm. you know, um, I know that so many people are dealing with um, family members who have been sick, or they themselves have been sick. And just remembering that this is not a common situation, this is an extraordinary situation that we are in, allows you I think to be a little more compassionate with yourself and to forgive yourself if there are days when it is hard to write and it is hard to focus. Um, I think I think it's important to to respect that you as a person are going each time um, and you can't always you know be productive every day during this. That's very nice to hear. Um, moving on, Ria Bhatia asks, from your book, which character do you relate to the most? Mm, that's an interesting question. Uh, a character that I found very interesting to write was P.T. Sir, the, um, mm. the teacher. Um, and I think that's because I found it quite a challenge a really exciting challenge to try to write a character who is not a flat villain. You know, he's not just like this evil person. He's an ordinary person who is tempted by his proximity to power. Um, and he's forced into a position where he has to make certain moral choices. He has to decide if he will prioritize himself and his family or if he will do what other people would consider the right thing. And I think that is such a difficult question for a person in his position. So I found it interesting to grapple with those moral choices in his character. Venkatesh Krishnamurti asks, is this novel influenced by two girls who were arrested for their Facebook posts after the death of a prominent Maharashtrian leader? Um, I'm not sure I know which specific out, but I think we have all read various news articles in this vein, you know, of people getting in trouble for liking things or forwarding things, posting things. Um, so I was definitely drawing from the realm of reality and stuff that we have read in the news. 
Um, Nikhil Taneja asks, what were the struggles of writing a child character for you and how did you overcome them? Um, well, like I was just saying, it's tough writing um, a child character with complexity without flattening them in any way. Um, I think I, I tried to write by trying to preserve the character's will, you know, even at a young age, um, this character has certain inclinations and certain agency. It is constrained in many ways, but it doesn't mean that it's not there. And so I try to be attentive to the ways in which this person from a very young age tries to speak up, tries to protect her parents, tries to do the right thing. We have time for just one more question. Uh, by Saki Roy asks, do you think the pandemic will influence your next piece of work? Oh, um, you know, it's early days. It's such early days in my, for my next book that I don't yet know what will filter its way in and what won't. Um, so we'll see, I guess. <laughs> It'll be a surprise to me. <laughs> Well, I, can't, I for one can't wait to read it. Uh, I think we're about done for time, but thank you so much, Megha. I have thoroughly enjoyed our discussion. I enjoy all our discussions, and I'm so glad we were able to do this. Thanks so much to Sanjoy, Namita, William, to the entire Teamworks team, and to JLF. This has been a lot of fun. I hope everyone will pick up a burning. It is a fantastic novel. Thank you so much, Manasi. The pleasure is all mine. Thank you so much, Manasi, for picking up the, the book and reading it cover to cover the first time and going out and acquiring it and publishing it. And thank you, Mansi, for what you've said about, uh, thank you, Mega, for what you've said about giving hope to people living in uh, with repressive governments and just, you know, the, the sheer fact that struggle at the end of the day could possibly surmount all of the obstacles that come upon your way. That, that was amazing. And for those of you who don't know, uh, uh, Megha did a conversation with Margaret Atwood and Margaret Atwood had read the book and she recommended a burning uh, for everybody to read. So I do hope you all will go down, go out and get the book. Apparently it's available on Amazon and of course on most bookstores. And, and thank you both for that wonderful conversation and thank you for all our audience for, for listening in. And I'm sorry, as usual, we couldn't take all of the questions uh, that you had posed. Um, if you've enjoyed the session, I hope you're going to log back on again, 8.30 p.m. for our next session. But before that, I need to also thank our official radio partners, Red FM, Bajati Raho. Our next session is uh, Chinese Whispers, Ambassador Gautam Bambabli and Suhasini Haider in conversation. A former Indian ambassador to China, Gautam Bambabli, a national editor and diplomatic affairs editor of the Hindu. So Hassani Haider speaks of India-China equations in terms of history and geopolitics and examines the changing posture and calibrated aggression of the Chinese dream. See you back at 8.30 p.m. Indian Standard Time.